Well, there's no doubt about it. Just like Samuel and the Israelites found themselves in a time of change and uncertainty, y'all, we're there too. There's no doubt about it. We're in the midst of constant change. In fact, the amount of change that we experience today seems to grow exponentially year by year. It's, it's no longer a lovely little straight line across that bar graph. It's, I guess it's not a bar graph, across the XY graph. It's a, it's a shooting up rocket the change that we experience. And, and we've accommodated that to some extent. Sometimes we even wait eagerly for change. The new ride opening at Disney World. The latest phone technology. What is it going to include? For some in the room, it might have been Bridgerton Season 3, Part 2. I have to wait till my daughter gets Netflix again. <laughs> but we are, we are in a season of change. We are experiencing the transition from a moderate spring to a much less moderate summer. We are in a season of political change as we have presidential elections happening again this year. Change is all around us. Even our own bodies change each and every day. And if you're like me, sometimes change is exciting anticipated. But sometimes change brings anxiety. And honestly, even those exciting changes bring anxiety. They're just, it, it's anxiety tempered with joy instead of anxiety tempered more with fear. Within the United Methodist Church, we're experiencing change. As we've just come out of another general conference, finally after eight years, and big actions happened that will potentially, well, in some cases have already changed the landscape of who we are as United Methodists. Now, not in any of our essentials, not in our doctrine, not in what we believe, but in, in how we live that out. There are changes, and for some that has been eagerly awaited, although there's still that sense of anxiety, and for others that has been just a source of anxiety and fear. But change is happening, and there's no avoiding it. That's part of how life is designed. But as change happens, as transitions occur, because transition is what follows change, we move from one thing to another, there are questions that can arise in our hearts or in our heads. Questions like, who? Who is affected by this change? Who will lead us in this time of change? Questions like, what? Sometimes that can be the, the sense of shock. What do you mean somebody different is preaching today? But it can also be a curiosity, what? What's different? I think I might like this, whatever the change might be. And so the question of what can be a season of, of learning and transition. Or the question might be why? Why is this change happening? 
the question of why acknowledges that even in anticipated and exciting change, there is also that sense of leaving something behind, something familiar. And there might also be a little bit of anger behind that why. There can be a little bit of bargaining or demanding for a different future. And that question of why might point us to sources of healing or growth. But I want to bring us back to that question of who. Who is going to take charge in this time of change? Who will do the things that need to be done? whether it's through a leadership role or other roles, who is going to get us through this time of not having an answer? And honestly, again, maybe not for y'all, but for me, when I ask that kind of who question, especially when my anxiety is more on the fear side, it's followed by a dear Lord, please not me. Dear Lord, please not me. The uncertainty can breed anxiety. Now, anxiety can be a good thing. It, it heightens our senses, it heightens our awareness, and in sports, that, that sense of tunnel vision that can come out of anxiety can lead to amazing things. There it's sometimes called being in the zone or being in the flow. And it can lead to pitching a no-hit baseball game or sinking three straight three-pointers in one game right after the other. Or thinking about how we're going to be observing the Summer Olympics in just a few weeks, we can think about the amazing things that some of our athletes are anticipated to be doing there. Things that we may have been seeing already in the trials leading up to. The ability to go faster, further, higher, or just wondering what our female gymnasts in particular, are going to pull out of the hat on the balance beam and the vault and the tumbling runs on the mat. How many releases and spins and things will happen on the uneven bar? Oh my gosh, y'all. And that comes out of that focus. Now we also know from the last Olympics one of those gymnasts, Simone Biles, that anxiety took over and led down a very different path. Led her to not be able to perform at all as she cared for herself in the midst of that anxiety. And honestly, believe it or not, that brings us to our scripture today. Now, when I was working with Jeff about what I would be preaching on, and I, I sent him my information, I also asked him to provide my apology to those who would read scripture today. Because first of all, it's a long passage, which when I'm reading scripture at Southgate, I, I sign up blindly. Somehow I get the longest passages. But not only is it a long passage, it's a passage with a lot of unfamiliar, shall we say, names. So thank you. Good job. Good job. But our scripture today brings us into the middle of First Samuel, a time of change, a time of anxiety. The people have gotten sick with the of the judges clamored for a king. God said, you don't want a king. They said, yes, we do. God said, no, you really don't. They said, yes, we do. And God said, all right. 
You think you know best. Here's a king. And I want to think that Saul started off with the best of intentions. But by this point, he's out of control. Things are not good for the kingdom. And being a kingdom, change in leadership does not happen easily. The people got the king they asked for. The one who has been anointed. But he turned out to be even worse than God, through Samuel, had warned the people about. He's enriching himself. He's losing battles. He's usurping the priesthood. And he's prone to alternating fits of depression and rage. Now, we know there are ways for a people to get rid of a king that is not doing well. It's called insurrection. It's called people who are against the king, rivals to the throne, rising up, risking splitting the nation in order to effect change. But... Insurrection has a cost. And there's usually a very violent aftermath, and I'm not able to think of very many times in recorded history when a people rising up has not beget further violence. Anxieties were running high. Samuel... Samuel was at a loss. And even, we're told, God was sorry about the state that God's people found themselves in. It's written out, verse 35. It's wild. There was nothing the people could do that wouldn't make things worse, but there was something God could do something God could do through Samuel. Now, it's important to understand that in the theopolitics, so this is a time when religion and politics were kind of combined together, so theopolitics of ancient Israel, it was understood by some that it was God who provided the king. God made a king. Just as God has raised up the judges and the prophets, God raised up the king. Now, an identified king couldn't take over if the current king was still ruling. That, that no. But you could identify the new king. Just as God had used Samuel to identify Saul... God was now going to use Samuel to identify the next king. And so Samuel gets his horn together, filled with anointing oil, so that he can anoint the one who will follow Saul. But he can't go about doing this terribly openly because of where Saul is at in his own journey. There is a threat to Samuel if he does this too openly. So he, he kind of finds a way to do what God is wanting him to do. He knows he needs to anoint one of Jesse's sons. This much God has told him. And he's figured out that he can, he can manufacture a way to get Jesse's sons together through offering a sacrifice. He could take a sacrifice and his priestly garb with him to meet up with Jesse and Jesse's sons, anoint the next king who was yet to be identified other than one of Jesse's sons, 
offer the sacrifice and all would be well. Samuel is still anxious and I don't blame him. Having the former judge of Israel on the move in this anxious season could provoke yet more anxiety and not so ideal reactions. But he moved on. He went as God directed. He reached the sacrificial site. He sent out word to Jesse to bring his sons to him. And Jesse came. Now remember, at this point, Jesse does not, still does not know which of Jesse's sons will be anointed. I'm not even sure that Samuel knew how many sons Jesse had. And so they go through, they go from oldest to youngest. Nope, the Lord hasn't called this one. Nope, the Lord hasn't called this one. Nope, the Lord hasn't called this one. And they get to the sons that Jesse has brought and Samuel's like, something is up. God said, one of your sons would be anointed. I would be anointing them to follow Saul. And it's not been these. Are you holding out on me? Now, Jesse, out of his own anxiety for his possessions, had indeed left the youngest son to care for the sheep. Money walking on four feet right there. God, feels like, oh my, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Call him in. Call him in. And indeed, this youngest son, David, is who Samuel is to anoint. I'm so thankful that Samuel thought to ask that follow-up question instead of assuming that Jesse had indeed brought all of his sons as instructed. Because again, I'm not sure if you're like me, but when I find myself in the midst of anxiety and, and that, that tunnel vision that I mentioned that can be so helpful at times, that's when I may find that tunnel vision to be detrimental because I could only see right in front, what's right in front of me, and I'm not even thinking to turn to the sides to see what else might show up in that tunnel vision, and I get, you know, you've heard of spiraling? Been there, done that. Thank goodness Samuel doesn't spiral. But he keeps his vision a little bit wider, asks that follow-up question, gets David in, and anoints him. And so, as we live our lives in the midst of change, as we live our lives in the midst of transitions, with that underlying sense of anxiety that can sometimes become all that we can see or know, I hope that we can learn from Samuel that we can remember to cast our vision a little wider, that we can breathe and seek God's voice, that we can watch for the Spirit's leading, because it, it is here with us. It is here with us. It's the voice that's reminding us to ask that follow-up question that we might not have thought about in the midst of our anxiety. That question of, is everybody here, perhaps? Or, who's not yet at the table? Or, what kind of face haven't we yet seen? Or, what gifts are we not thinking about? What kind of voice haven't we heard? What kind of abilities or disabilities have we not considered? That voice, God's presence, is with us, just as it was with Samuel. And perhaps the decisions that we will need to make in the midst of our change 
may not be as individually as significant as Samuel anointing David. But I do believe that they affect the kingdom of God that we are all living in. So my prayer, my prayer that I invite you to this day as we listen to Samuel and as I try to pull my microphone off, may we trust the one who knows us better than we know ourselves to lead us to those we don't yet know and maybe find among them the answer to our anxiety in these times of constant change. Lord, may this be so. In your holy name, amen.